Does this, yeah. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, I am Reza, I'm a postdoctoral researcher based at UCL, uh, Department of Chemical Engineering. And um, today I want to talk, you, to, talk to you about um, a different scale that uh, normally are used to it, which is a uh, process scale, the biggest scale that the catalyst is affecting. Um, the aim of the project was to, um, to define or develop a methodology that uses uh, process system engineering tools in order to aid the in, in silico uh, catalyst design. Uh, before going to, through the methodology, uh, it's worth to mention how uh, the traditional approach to catalyst design works. Um, we normally start by identifying a, a candidate catalyst, which comes from um, a catalyst searcher space. Um, it can be based on a target reaction, um, some data from literature, expert knowledge, or based on different constraints that uh, we might have. Uh, then we need to iteratively synthesize and test catalysts um, through experimental design, um, synthesis, and performance tests. Uh, and once we have a catalyst, then um, we normally are done at that stage. That is what we will be used at the process scale. Um, However, at the moment, most of the catalysts um, developed in academia do not find their way into industry. There are thousands of papers published on catalysis every year, uh, but based on an industrial report, we just have around 300 um, catalysts working in the industry at the moment. Um, so in the next, uh, 30 or four uh, minutes, uh, I will explain how the methodology works in detail, um, followed by a case study uh, to show how every step of this methodology is applied. Uh, so in system-oriented approach, um, as I said, we are trying to do in silico studies to understand how the catalyst attributes um, or performance indicators uh, impact upon the whole process. This is, impact can be uh, measured in terms of um, key, key performance indicators such as profit, uh, cost, sustainability, or constraints such as safety. And the goal is uh, to find the optimal targets for the catalyst um, ranges or to select um, the best catalyst within a number of candidates. Um, so in summary, this uh, schematic what it uh, shows that we again start from catalyst search space. Um, we are uh, narrowed down by a number of candidates. Um, we do some experimentation uh, in order to get some kinetic models if required. Uh, however, I will explain later that um, we can skip this uh, stage if required. Um, then the result of this uh, stage is used in the next step, which is uh, normally done um, after the catalyst is developed, which is simulation and optimization of the process and the quantification of the impact of these catalyst uh, attributes on the whole process. And um, in the system-oriented approach, uh, once this is done, we can check if the, uh, the result is satisfactory. This is if, if uh, the catalyst um, is optimal enough for, for our um, needs. Otherwise, uh, we can have a feedback loop um, to, in order to guide the chemist to design um, new catalyst or modify the current ones in order to uh, be more optimal. 
Um, so in the uh, catalyst candidate selection step, um, we normally think about uh, possible routes to the target molecule that we want to produce and the reactions involved. Um, we might have some data in the lit literature, uh, again, some expert knowledge. Uh, we might have some constraints based on the reactions that we are dealing with, um, or we might have some initial experiments. And uh, all of these can fit through, um, uh, can affect how we uh, choose the uh, catalyst candidates. In the next step, in the kinetic modeling step, uh, we should first think of if the uh, catalyst that we are considering is existing or is a hypothetical one. If the catalyst exists, uh, we need to check if the kinetic models are available for that reaction. Um, if the uh, models are not available, we go through the kinetic modeling steps, design of experiments, um, lab or pilot scale ex experiments. Uh, then we need to have some candidates for kinetic models. Um, we need these models have uh, some parameters that needs to be estimated. Uh, we need to validate these kinetic models and also quantify uh, the uncertainty. We can also have another uh, feedback loop here, uh, which is normally known as uh, model-based design of experiment, which um, the, the experiment design is guided by our requirements within the kinetic model. Um, and if the, we are thinking about a hypothetical catalyst, um, we either can uh, produce some artificial data and uh, do kinetic modeling based on this uh, artificial data, or just assume uh, a, um, um, a reactor product ratio, because this product distribution basically is what a catalyst uh, selectivity or conversion, um, how this selectivity or conversion would affect the separation steps. Uh, the next important step is the process uh, synthesis, design and simulation. Uh, the first very important step, uh, which is common in chemical engineering, uh, is first we need to have proper thermodynamic models in order to uh, explain the thermophysical uh, properties of the mixture because um, the design of the process, the separation systems, all of them depend on the, this model. So this must be uh, correct. Next is the conceptual process design um, and also simulation of the process uh, for the route or routes that we have considered. If our um, key performance indicators um, are economics, we need also to size these operating units uh, in order to estimate the costs. Uh, next, we need to do some economic evaluation for in terms of capital and operating cost of the plant. And again, uh, uncertainty quantification because the uncertainties that arise from uh, previous steps needs to be quantified uh, at this step as well. Um, if the criteria that we want is satisfied, uh, is not satisfied, we can go back again to the first step, otherwise can move on to the process optimization step. At this step, uh, we need to do plant-wide optimization. Uh, which basically give, should gives us um, the reaction route, the best reaction route, the choice of unit operations and configurations, the operating conditions of these um, units, uh, as well as um, in order to minimize or maximize the KPIs that we, um, we want to study. If the criteria at this step is not satisfied, we can again go back and Otherwise, we have we are left with either the uh, 
uh, optimal catalyst or the optimal uh, ranges, working ranges for the uh, desired catalyst. Um, in this presentation today, I will talk about the first three steps um, as uh, the last uh, pro process optimization step. It is uh, an ongoing work. Um, so to summarize, uh, the holistic or system-oriented methodology to catalyst design um, would provide us with catalyst attributes in terms of selectivity, conversion, uh, selectivity or activity uh, by examining the effect of the catalyst on the whole process. Uh, we can have a specific objectives uh, such as economic objectives, sustainability objectives, environmental impacts, etc. Um, and in order for this methodology to work, we need to have uh, different kinds of data, such as suitable reaction routes, uh, relevant kinetic models, thermodynamic data, um, in order to be able to perform these calculations. However, as I explained, um, there are workarounds when we don't have um, kinetic models. Uh, the case study that I'm going to talk about is um, what our collaborators have worked on is butanol dehydration process. Um, the, the, their goal was to uh, study how butanol is, um, how we can produce propane through a cascade uh, system from um, butanol. And we focused uh, our uh, research on the first step. Uh, in this reaction, uh, the reactant is the um, pure butanol, and the main uh, products are butane isomers, dibutyl ether, and water. Uh, the butane isomers are of interest as commodity intermediate, while dibutyl ether um, is an interesting biorenewable uh, solvent. They have uh, studied uh, two main catalysts. Uh, they, they studied a number of catalysts, but the best options they found from the pre-screening uh, step was were, uh, HZSM5 and H-beta. Uh, the experimental setup and data uh, that we use, that we need in our uh, methodology uh, are given here. Um, they have, uh, they, uh, the pure butanol is vaporized, uh, goes into a plug flow reactor, um, which is heated in the tubular furnace from 200 to 300 degrees C. Um, the inner diameter of this reactor was uh, a quarter of inch. Uh, they used 100 milligram of uh, catalyst, and um, the product was analyzed using GC. Um, one note is that in, in the uh, results that I will be showing is that we assumed one butene to uh, represent the mixture of isomers of butene. Uh, because uh, at the time that we got this data, uh, the GC that our collaborators had was not able to differentiate between the isomers. It is one reason, and the uh, in our, and also to um, uh, simplify the kinetic modeling. Uh, they also found that the maximum temperature that this reaction should work is 250 degrees C to avoid. Uh, ibutin and coking, which is uh, not good for the next steps in the cascade system. Uh, these are just um, um, the limited data that we worked with uh, in terms of um, flow rate and temperature. One when, uh, once when is fixed and the other is uh, changed, and uh, they reported the results in terms of catalyst uh, attributes, selectivities of the main products, butins uh, and dibutyl ether, and also the conversion of the 
uh, butanol for uh, both catalysts. Um, it, it is also worth um, explaining a bit how the kinetic modeling is normally done, whether you want to do it in approximately or in a detailed way. Um, in all these cases, you normally need to build a process, um, a, a, an experimental digital twin based on the data that I just showed, for example, the size of reactor, et cetera, the flow rates, uh, temperatures, et cetera. Um, once you have that, you need to uh, have some experimental data um, in order to be able, for example, uh, uh, the selectivities and conversions here and here, in order to be able to um, find, to estimate the parameters for the kinetic models that you have, uh, and also to validate them. Um, once you have the uh, a validated model unit, uh, you can then move on to the next steps. Uh, so to show you the uh, results of this step, um, we assume three um, main possible reaction pathways uh, in this case. Uh, once is parallel uh, formation of butene uh, and dibutyl ether. Uh, or consecutive formation uh, and then fragmentation of the dibutyl ether and or the, or the combination of the two, uh, which is termed triangular here. Uh, we use the simple um, kinetic model, power law. Uh, three main parameters need, needs to be estimated, shown in red, activation energy, uh, reaction order, and um, pre-exponential factor. Uh, and we use uh, maximum likelihood estimation as the algorithm in order to estimate these parameters. These are the results. Uh, it shows how um, the estimated parameters, how the model that is produced is able to estimate uh, the catalyst attributes, selection, uh, selectivity, uh, and conversion once compared with uh, experimental data. Uh, and for the three pathways that we considered, and we found from the graph and also from the numerical data that uh, both parallel and consecutive networks uh, works better. Uh, and parallel uh, pathway was working uh, a bit better than consecutive one. Um, once you, when you have you when when you do parameter estimation, um, you uh, normally have um, some uncertainty, and it is very important to quantify this uncertainty in the next steps. Uh, so one tool that can aid us is called um, is global sensitivity analysis. A, a quick introduction. Um, in contrast to local or one factor at a at a time, um, sensitivity analysis. Uh, GSA basically lets us to see how uncertainty, uh, how, how joint or different uncertainties in the uh, model input uh, would affect uh, the uncertainty in the uh, model output. For example, how um, ranges of different parameters would affect the estimation of the kinetic model. These are uncertainties uh, arises from different sources, um, such as errors in the data, measurement data, for example, in the experimentation step, in the parameter estimation procedure, uh, which I just showed, and also the uh, kinetic model structure itself. So these uncertainties needs to be propagated through the uh, model to see how um, they would affect uh, our results. Um, a, a result for this uh, step, uh, it's the kind of results that you get for, for example, these are the parameters that need, needed to be estimated, the estimated value, and the confidence. 
So uh, you can have ranges for the confidence in these parameters. Uh, and um, it would then you have uh, uh, like six inputs to the model. You can sample this uh, six dimensional um, space and then see how different uh, combinations uh, would affect the outputs using Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, once you do that, uh, you can um, you can show the results, for example, in uh, box plots. Um, here is the effect of uncertainty in kinetic parameters on catalyst um, attributes. Uh, what you can see here is the um, higher, we have higher uncertainties uh, for H beta selectivities, which uh, we should be aware because it would affect our results in the next steps. Um, another observation can be is that uh, we can, if we want to, we can improve this uh, by further experimentation. So this can guide your uh, design of experiments as well. Um, and these ranges um, for butanol conversion and selectivities, uh, the ranges that we have, uh, for example, is it whether between 80 uh, to 90 percent or will it be somewhere between 50 to 90 percent? So these uh, numbers would affect how you would design um, a robust separation system in the next step, which will, uh, I explain. Um, another step is the process synthesis design and simulation. Um, um, you want to see how these catalyst attributes would affect the whole process uh, so that these impacts um, can be taken into account. Uh, this would help to identify the optimal uh, catalyst characteristics uh, and the uh, associated routes if you want to consider different routes. Uh, and also you want to see how uh, you want to make sure that you abide by, uh, for example, uh, different constraints such as safety. And at the same time, you also you want to uh, minimize or maximize your um, objective, which can be minimizing cost. Uh, at these steps, uh, at this step, capital and operating costs are uh, often the primary variables of interest because of uh, uh, at industrial scale. Uh, so we need to do unit sizing and cost estimation as well. Uh, we normally in chemical engineering, you we use process simulators at this stage um, in order to compare different process layouts um, to size the units and also to quantify the uh, uncertainties. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, thermophysical properties are also very important uh, because all process design studies need to, um, all the calculations need uh, these thermophysical uh, models in order to generate the results. So if it is wrong, uh, your results, all of your results will be wrong. So you need to make sure uh, this is correct. And it is not always as straightforward. So it highly depends on the components that you are working with. Um, and these thermophysical property models uh, need to be defined based on the accuracy in predicting the vapor liquid equilibrium uh, in the, um, of the mixture components. Uh, because it uh, guides the separation uh, design um, at next step. These are some samples uh, for this system that we dealt with. Um, the components are butanol, dibutyl ether, and water. These are the uh, isothermal uh, vapor liquid equilibrium um, for different uh, binary systems, butanol, dibutyl ether, dibutyl ether, water, etc. Uh, the markers show uh, some experimental data for these, um, and you need to 
find a model that best fits these experimental data. Some of these models also have some parameters that can be estimated. Um, what you can see here is, for example, here, the Unifac uh, modified Dortmund uh, model was the best because uh, it fits the first graph perfectly and also um, is able to uh, show the azeotropic point, which is very important uh, for this bi two binary mixtures. So as I said, we use the Dortmund modified Unifac model in this step um, because it was able to accurately predict the vapor liquid equilibrium. Uh, this is a ternary phase diagram that we also work with when we want to design uh, separation systems. Um, these are this is for the dibutyl ether, butanol, and water. Uh, as we can see at Atmospheric pressure, we have four azeotropes, which makes the pressure system more complex. Uh, the green zone is the two liquid zone, which is another important property of this system, uh, which we need to uh, be aware when we design the, uh, sometimes we can take advantage of these properties when we design the uh, separation system. Um, all of, uh, as I said, these three uh, azeotropic points are heterogeneous. Uh, we have liquid-liquid equilibrium, um, except the one on the top between dibutyl ether and butanol. And that one also can be avoided if you, you increase the pressure. So it's a pressure-sensitive azeotropic point. So based on these considerations, uh, you need to move on to the uh, next step which is process synthesis design and simulation. Uh, for this step, we assumed uh, three main possibilities, which uh, we call scenarios here. One scenario for uh, this case was, imagine we have a full conversion. If we have full conversion, uh, meaning we won't have any butanol at the product, um, and the main product, the butins have a much lower molecular weight. So those can be easily separated using a flash drum. At the bottom, we would have uh, the majority of the byproduct would be water with trace amounts of dibutyl ether. Um, so you can also um, try to separate those two if you want to. So this is scenario A, scenario B, uh, is considering we have a medium conversion. Uh, and uh, in this case, um, as we have some solubility of butins in the butanol, we need another column to separate the dissolved butins here. Then the mixture is uh, the mixture of butanol, water, uh, and dibutyl ether is fed into a decanter. And here we take advantage of the, um, the heterogeneous uh, azeotrope or, or, and the liquid-liquid uh, equilibrium because it can um, be easily separated using gravity in two phases, one um, um, water-rich, almost 90 plus 98% uh, water in this phase. Uh, and, and another phase, um, organic phase, which is uh, around 60 to 40 uh, butanol. No uh, dibutyl ether would enter this stream. Uh, so this would be uh, an easy separation here. Just we need to separate the trace amounts of butanol here. Uh, at this column, we sub at the bottom of this column, we have our butanol and uh, dibutyl ether. Uh, another assumption for this scenario is that we don't, we won't, we won't consider butanol recycling uh, because if we want to, we need to add another separation system. Um, and scenario C is um, when you have medium conversion and you wanna 
do a total separation of the older components um, and uh, recycle the unreacted butanol back to the feed. So if you, uh, once you do this step and size the units, uh, as there are a lot of mathematics behind it in terms of sizing and um, co uh, cost estimations. Uh, but these, these are a summary of the results to compare the effect of these two um, catalysts on, on uh, considering three uh, main scenarios. In terms of capital cost, uh, as expected, scenario A is much cheaper compared to the other two. However, the uh, cost, the capital cost is uh, negligible compared to uh, raw material cost. So most of the operating cost of the system comes from um, the, uh, the cost of the feed. And also, uh, most importantly, uh, the economic KPIs. Um, you can compare them in terms of uh, revenue, total annualized cost, uh, profit or the cost for the butane that is produced. Uh, so in this case, you can see for scenario A and uh, for both catalysts, we have a uh, we have the same uh, number. We can produce uh, butane at the same cost. Um, so the constraint, that, for example, that I talked about in this case is uh, considering we should have 99.9% .9 pure um, product, both uh, butanes, water, and butanol, all of them. After this step, we can again use um, GSA in order to see the effect of uh, uncertainty in the parameters that you estimated in the previous steps, um, because it also depends on the pre precision of those uh, parameters as well. Uh, this graph shows uh, those effects on total annualized cost, uh, profit, and butane uh, production cost. Again, uh, you can see how uncertainties that we had um, for the H beta is showing its effect here um, in terms of total annualized uh, profit and butane production cost for H beta. Um, so for this scenario, uh, when HZSM5 and H beta uh, oper operate at the same conversion, which is what we did in the in the simulation. We fixed the conversion for both catalysts. Um, HZSM5 uh, shows to be a better catalyst uh, based on the butane production cost. Um, so to summarize these results, uh, it showed that the scenario A is the best design with the lowest capital and operating costs uh, because it has the high production rate and the low production cost per kilogram uh, and higher profit around 1.8 times uh, the scenario C. Uh, so it means that due to the nature of the mixture of uh, streams that we are dealing with and the costly separation requirements, um, like separation B, uh, scenario B and C, uh, maximizing the conversion is the most economically viable option. We can do this through higher temperatures using a different catalyst with a higher activity, uh, but without compromising selectivity or increasing the reactor space time. In terms of raw materials, uh, as you saw, they comprise the main portion of the operating cost. So reducing the fresh feed consumption, uh, consumption through recycling um, the unreacted uh, butanol um, will improve the economics. Uh, and we also um, 
thought that HDSM5 is the better choice uh, at a conversion similar to H-beta um, due to higher selectivity to butins. However, um, H-beta is another is, is a better option at the same reactor temperature and reactor size because uh, below 250 degrees C, H-beta showed to have a, a higher conversion yeah. compared to HLSM5. So the best catalyst here, again, here depends on your needs. Uh, the details of these results uh, are given uh, in this paper given below, um, which you might uh, want to refer to. Um, so for the future, uh, I want to use, um, to quote Shlugel uh, et al, um, which uh, says the research community is currently equipped with uh, all the necessary tools for accurate and complete uh, description, prediction, and synthesis of optimized uh, catalytic materials for targeted uh, chemical processes. And we argue that catalysis research must further be guided by whole process consideration rather than simply improving uh, a catalyst performance. Uh, this can be applied both in catalyst selection uh, or optimization. And in order to be able to do that, we need to um, connect uh, the data backbone of catalyst design, which starts from synthesis uh, parameters, uh, characterization data, um, such as instrumental and measurement metadata, uh, catalytic performance data, um, plus the, um, for example, the errors of the sensors, so, uh, and also the uh, results of this methodology, the process-wide implication of uh, catalyst KPIs. Uh, so all of these steps need to be able to uh, communicate uh, through the lifetime of a uh, catalyst design. Um, in order to do that, uh, we have some challenges and opportunities. Um, I, I like this graph uh, from Wolf et al, uh, which shows the data value chain for catalyst science. Uh, um, they, as catalyst scientists, they not only um, considered process uh, synthesis as designed to be uh, an, an important last step in catalysis design. But what is interesting is uh, they have also considered that this feedback loop should be connected. So whatever I said today was um, tools, about tools and methodologies in order to be able to connect this feedback loop in future. Um, this process-oriented methodology can work with limited artificial or no kinetic data at all. However, uh, we need universal ways of storing and mm, indexing, transferring data uh, because it would aid uh, in closing this feedback loop at process scale. Uh, in terms of the system engineering side of things, we also need to advances in flush sheeting softwares. We need better algorithms when it comes to uh, optimization. We need better customizability um, because at the moment uh, we have a lot of issues for, uh, with them. Uh, and this would only be possible with multi uh, multidisciplinary collaborations between theoretical scientists, uh, experimental and computational chemistry, um, uh, computer engineer, data scientists, chemical engineers, um, etc. Um, so at the end, I want to thank um, our, my PI, Professor Gavlidis, uh, and the co-PIs of the project, uh, Dr. Galvanin, Professor Sorensen, uh, and John Blacker, uh, our collaborator, um, which provided, uh, who provided uh, the experimental data Phil Dyer and uh, Yiping Shi at University of Durham, uh, as well as uh, professors uh, Weller, Catlow, and Hutchings for uh, all the 
uh, guidance and support. And also thanks to the Catalysis Hub um, for supporting these projects uh, financially. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's very clear. I think we have time for one question over here, Keith. One quick co comment, which is a compliment to say, it was great that you said that the solution to improving your process was to find a catalyst that worked better at high temperature. And that's often the case in large scale um, production facilities and processes. Finding a catalyst that's equivalently selective at a high temperature is the better catalyst. The other point that I wanted to raise, you haven't covered uh, heat and power at all in your analysis, and that's... Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's another area that, um, for example, heat integration, uh, it's another important part. It can all be the controlling factor in the economics of the process. Yeah, so, yeah it does, yeah. Cool. Um, and also the activation is another uh, important parameter it need, can be included. Okay, let's thank Reza once again for his lecture.